Okay, good seeing you here this morning. We want to go back to Luke here this morning as we continue on, kind of in the uh, chronological, uh, uh, very slow pace of the journey through the Gospels. And we'll be back in Luke. In fact, Luke is the only uh, account, the only Gospel that records this event. Um, in regards to the other thief, as well as we'll call it, the, the thief that uh, sort of changed his mind from his, his uh, comments uh, earlier. And uh, so we'll be looking at that here this morning. Luke chapter 23, verses 40 to 43. I will read it, and then we'll start with a word of prayer. Luke chapter 23, verse 40 says this. But the other answering and rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But we have done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Before we kind of dive into those couple of verses, I'll speak with the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, dive into it, to uh, study it out. And I pray that you would certainly allow me to decrease so that you alone would increase that. You know, the grasp the truth for our lives, the application of our hearts and our feet uh, here this morning. And I just pray that uh, certainly, whether it be somebody in this room or certainly somebody that we all perhaps know, that uh, you would just use us in and uh, continuing on the, the challenge of, of, of these verses by our own lives, by our own testimony. We thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the, the, I'm going to call this just because I couldn't come up with a, a great title for, uh, well, not that any of titles are great, but a, a, a sounding title for this. Uh, uh, how gradual is instant? A, a Gallup poll uh, conclusion came to this, and, I, and I'll quote this, this is literally what it is, the conclusion. There's little difference in ethical behavior between the unchurch or the church and the unchurch. There's as much pilferage and dishonesty among the church as the unchurch. And I'm afraid that applies pretty much across the board. Religion per se is not really life changing. People cite it as important, for instance, in overcoming depression, but it doesn't have primacy in determining behavior. And uh, what, a, what a sad flight of, of religion per se, as he says. Nobody gave this uh, anecdote, and uh, it's rather lengthy, so bear with me. I'll, I'll read it from his words. Um, a man named Professor Drummond once described a man going into one of our after meetings and saying he wanted to become a Christian. Well, my friend, what is the trouble? He doesn't like to tell. He is greatly agitated. Finally, he says... The fact is I have overdrawn my account, which apparently in that day and age was a polite way of saying that he was a thief. Uh, did you take your employer's money? The answer was yes. How much? I don't know. I've never kept account of it. Well, you have an idea that you stole, say, $1,500 last year. Obviously, this is back in when $1,500 was a whole lot more than it was today. Uh, I'm afraid it is as much. So then the, the response, and again, this is just kind of as illustration, he says, now look here, sir, I don't believe in sudden work. Don't steal more than $1,000 this next year. And the next year, not more than 500 In the course of the next few years, you will get it. So you won't steal it anymore. If your employer catches you, tell them you are being converted. And you will get so that you won't steal any by and by. My friend, says Dale Moody, that thing is a perfect farce. Let him that stole steal no more. And that is what the Bible says it is. It is right about face. Take another illustration. Moody continues on. Here comes a man. He admits that he gets drunk every week. He comes to a meeting and wants to be converted. Shall I say, don't you be in a hurry. I believe in doing the work gradually. Don't you get drunk and knock your wife down more than once a month? Wouldn't it be refreshing to his wife to go a whole month without being knocked down or beat? Or once a month, only 12 times in a year. Wouldn't you be glad to have him converted in this new way? Only well, get drunk after a few years on the anniversary of your wedding at Christmas, and then it'll be effective because it is gradual. Moody says, oh, I detest all that kind of teaching. Let us go to the Bible and see what that old book teaches. Let us believe it and go and act as if we believed it too. Salvation is instantaneous. I admit that a man may be converted so he cannot tell when he crosses the line between death and life. But I also believe a man may be a thief one moment and the next. 
I believe a man may be as vile as hell itself one moment and be saved the next. Christian growth is gradual, just as physical growth is. But a man passes from death unto everlasting life, quick as an act of the will. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Certainly repentance, while it, repentance alone does not save us, certainly it was a, a work of Christ that saves us, but repentance is going to be a part of that. And uh, I know that there are times when people have been saved, and it, and it truly, because of our flesh, because of our nature, uh, there are times when take some work, take some counseling, take some time in the Word of God, uh, some conviction of the Holy Spirit before our lives are changing in some habits that, that uh, are, are we hold on to too, uh, too tightly. But I also believe that the power of God is powerful enough to change it, man. I think the, uh, I forget the guy's name. I believe it's whoever is the ramp is dedicated to, or his memorial paid for, and I cannot remember, it seems like Walter was his first name. I can't remember what call it, but it seems like that, that whoever that was, from the story that I've heard, because he was passed away before I was here too long, uh, that he was quite a, uh, 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 I guess for lack of a better, quite a drunk. He was quite a drunk. And I believe he came here for a special service and got saved and uh, he drank no more. And uh, the Lord completely transformed his life from that point forward. Now, I don't know. I don't know the details on that. That's just for long repeat what I've heard. Oswald Chamber said it, said it very well. It is not repentance that saves me. Repentance is a sign that I realize what God has done in Christ Jesus. The danger is to put the emphasis on the effect instead of on the cause. Is it my obedience that puts me right with God? <clears throat> the answer is never. I am put right with God because prior to all else, Christ died. When I turn to God and my belief accept what God reveals instantly by a stupendous atonement of Jesus Christ, rushes me into a right relation with God. By the miracle of God's grace, I stand justified, not because of anything I have done, but because of what Jesus has done. The salvation of God does not stand on human logic. It stands on the sacrificial death of Jesus. Sinful men and women can be changed into new creatures by the marvelous work of God in Christ Jesus, which is prior to all of our experience. In uh, this, this passage, and we certainly probably have all heard challenges in regards to this, uh, and, uh, boy, the doctrine that is refuted, even, we'll all say doctrine, false doctrine that is refuted uh, by these few verses is, is uh, pretty overwhelming at times because uh, of things that, at, in some places, become paramount to an entire denomination can be refuted just by this one man's life, just by his one man, man's example. How gradual is instant? What is required for uh, instant in our home, um, I'll in on the, uh, our breakfast table every morning. I have two, uh, two preferences for uh, cereal. My favorite cereal is uh, Crispix. I, I love Crispix, but Walmart does not always seem to have it. As pretty much everything that I determine that I really like, Walmart doesn't seem to always have it. <laughs> uh, and so then when Christmas is not available, we go with uh, Cinnamon Mice. And uh, not as much of an excitement, I guess Mike, because my name's not Mike. <laughs> Uh, not as much of an excitement for me. Uh, my kids will have no idea what that means, but Mike, <laughs> Mike, he likes, Mike he likes it, exactly. Um, but anyway, one thing that is, if you've ever had at least the cinnamon, that's all I've eaten is the cinnamon life, uh, you, you literally have to have some sort of special equipment to get in that box. Uh, it, it's the more instant than box. But uh, that life cereal, uh, I have struggled and, and pulled and twisted and uh, shaken and uh, thought I was going to pop and explode. Oh, nothing. It was like an indestructible bag. And uh, I think the only way that we determined to get into that cereal is by scissors. And I uh, just cut the top right off of, of, that, of that bag. And so I know that we live in a society where while we strive to have everything instant, we really have to redefine what instant means. Instant noodles. Except maybe in college, <laughs> when we, we probably eat them just raw, uh, do not uh, are, are not instant. Uh, I know that uh, again, our society is all about right now, right here. Uh, when even going through McDonald's drive-thru can take a very long time at, at certain times. 
And uh, we look at this testimony of this man and the words of our Lord, and what a reminder of the power of salvation unto all men. A couple of points. In fact, I have three points before we get to our main three points. Uh, three quick points as a matter of introduction. Uh, what about sins that we are ignorant of in our life? So then we probably have all heard, maybe we've even done this. But we've all heard someone confessing so that they didn't know they confessed. And uh, I think a truly repentant heart is going to have that desire to, to stand right God in realization of my own sin. And realization that I am certain that I've committed sins that I'm not even sure I was aware of. And uh, certainly there are times when we have those uh, uh, sins that we are ignorant about. But is true repentance... Confessing a sin that we aren't aware of? Uh, are, are we truly repentant of that? Uh, you know, and, and for instance, they use a, a, uh, a, a, a situation here at Toulon. And, and Toulon is still on the uh, ordinance of the... Of the uh, we have burn days that you cannot burn. We have burn dates, which means you can't burn on those days. That's how that works. Uh, apparently back in the day, Mondays and Thursdays were wash days. I don't know if that was universal or just too long, but Mondays and Thursdays were wash days, and on Mondays and Thursdays you, you cannot burn. Well, I came into town, and, uh, uh, you know, this time of year, there's leaves everywhere. I raked up my leaves in the yard. It's a perfect day, and on a Thursday, I lit the fire. Perhaps before long, a neighbor would be complaining to the police, and the police would come out to your house and say, hey, you can't burn today. It's, uh, it's a burn day. You can't burn today. And uh, I could give the innocence, say, I didn't know. I just moved to town. I didn't. I had never heard of this. I, I didn't realize this. I apologize. I'll put the fire out. I won't do this again. Uh, in that reality, I, I am making a confession that I won't do because now I know. But before I knew, I didn't. How, how could I repent? How could I, you know, how, how could I change my ways if I'm not even aware of it? Now, if the police officer comes back to my house the next Thursday because I'm burning again. Uh, obviously, there has been uh, really no no repentance. And as we look at these verses, I'm reminded of a man who changed his life, changed his mind, changed his eternity. And then as well, are reminded of the fact that undoubtedly there is, at least in the passerbyers, that's the correct word of saying it, those who are passing by, those that perhaps on this day were mocking Christ as he hung on the cross, Perhaps some of those, if not many of those, would be counted in the thousands that were saved after the day of Pentecost. And how they could ridicule Christ one day and come to saving knowledge of him another day. How this thief could be guilty of death one day and literally find life on his deathbed the next. Uh, it's just an amazing aspect. In regard to how hard God is. But secondly, second quick truth. What about intentional sins committed uh, earlier? And I've heard a lot of people, and we probably all have. People that have confessed that they, they, they would love to be able to accept what Christ has done for them. But they'll say something along these lines. But you don't know what I have done. Uh, example of a man who death row because of the, and it, also the thief, that really is kind of a, a general term. This is not because he stole a candy bar from Walmart, <laughs> uh, the pre-first uh, century Walmart. Uh, this, this was not because uh, he took uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of plots of land from his neighbor and then stuck his fields over. Uh, the very thief that would, would have been worthy of death would have been one that probably had caused great bodily harm, not death to somebody else during the process of, of his thieving. But it is something that would have committed such a crime of a, an atrocity of crimes that would have been worthy of death instead of his fines or imprisonment or literally on the, in the Jewish of, of, of what he had stolen. And so as we consider this man who had the, the worst of the worst sins before, as we would rate it, coming to a saving knowledge of Christ, it refutes those that would say, well, you know, I would love to, but my past. And uh, uh, certainly as, as uh, we consider it again him. The third truth that I find kind of phenomenal about this illustration is the very reality that Christ hung between two thieves. 
and uh, the equal access, let's say, the equal opportunity on even on the cross. And I don't know if this was the very the reason for the case, but this is what I'll say is one of the advantages of this, whether it was the ordained reason for it or not. But here we have two men on either side of Christ, equal distance from Christ, hearing and seeing all that Christ said, and all that the crowd said in return, and one chose while the one continued to reject. And what a, a reminder of, of the position that Christ is in so many lives. Right there between the two. Do you imagine if it would have been Christ on one of the end and the guy in the middle was the one who continued to reject? I've been able to hear all that was going on at the other end, perhaps. Uh, or if it would have been reversed, we would be able to say, well, you know, the one guy, that's because he was right next to Christ, but the poor guy on the end didn't have a chance. Here we have Christ in the middle. Again, I don't know if that's reasoning why. I don't know if that was a divine appointment to have Christ in the middle and, and there on either side. I believe that was a fulfillment of one of the prophecies, but the reasoning, uh, I am not. But I certainly acknowledge the fact that I think it's amazing that two thieves had equal opportunity and how that applies into our lives as well for us as thieves, for us as sinners, for us who are also worthy of death. We've been given equal opportunity for Christ. But look at verse 40. Kind of three things that uh, become very clear in this one man's change of, of life. Verse 40 says, But the other answered and rebuked him, meaning the other thief, saying, Moses says, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Consider the mocking of the soldiers, the mocking of the crowd, all those were passing by as they are wagging their heads, wagging their fingers, and making a mockery of Christ. And, and uh, they, now just one person, now, now we know that Mary and, and John and a few other ladies were already there at the cross, and Christ has already addressed them directly. Uh, but here we have one person who was able to speak out above the crowd, so to speak, and rebukes the other thief and says, do you not fear God? You know, the very reality in regards to a, a instantaneous salvation is, we can say it this way, the, the fear of God. Do you not fear God? And, and the, the reality of, of what he is saying because of his predicament. Here he is sit, hanging on the cross. They are, all three of them, going to die here in, in the very near future. Uh, that is evident. Obviously, none of us know we all are living a life that is but a vapor. None of us know what the very next hour holds. But these three men know that the next hour holds death. And his response is not in regards to, hey, how can you rebuke this man when all three of us are hanging on this cross? His rebuke is, do you hear God? Do you not fear God? Now I know that in in life here on this earth we have laws of man. I just talked about the bird ban. But could you imagine? Let's just say, for instance, could you imagine if the penalty for speeding was a dollar? How many of us would not speed probably all the time? And if I can make it to Kiwani and back in just a matter of you know half the time that I used to, it's only going to cost me a dollar. If I have a trip to get, you know, we went to California, uh, and most of that trip is 70 miles an hour, and so that to me seems fast enough. A dollar, and we had a view, I don't know how fast that transit van could go that we had rented, but, you know, not even mine. <laughs> not even my van to worry about. We can get to California just a little bit quicker. And, if, you know, if we get gone, it's only cost us a buck. And unfortunately, a lot of the times, the... The penalty is, is a deterrent to the crime, so to speak. And you can tell by Springfield and uh, Washington, D.C., which, which laws are more important to them than others by the, the realm of the penalty. Uh, sadly, I believe it was January 1st last year was, if I'm not mistaken, was when they made um, increased rulings for abortion, if I can say that. So they're in support of abortion, but at the same time, basically made it a greater crime, a far greater crime to do danger to a dog 
than it is to a human being. And obviously, then what we can detect in as far as our legislators are going, they have more concern to animals than they do to people. And uh, the penalty is is obviously wrong in that regard. This man is realizing who he is, but he's also realizing who God is. Do you not fear? I think that there are people in church, churches today, there's probably one in most every church today, at least one in most every church today, who are sitting there living on the hope of their eternity based on nothing more than, I don't want the penalty. I don't want hell. I, I don't want to go to hell so bad. I would rather go to heaven. And I think there are people that are living on the very reality of, how can I avoid the punishment, avoid the fine, so to speak, without a reality of the fear of God? Do you not fear God? I made a note of one of the uh, team things that we went to many years ago now. Um, the fantastic. Uh, the, the speaker gave a, it was, I think it was three messages on that Saturday. Maybe four, three messages. And all three of them were on hell, which the first one I thought, you know, this is a strong message on hell and, and obviously they'll scare anybody to death. And uh, there were tons of hands raising and uh, they wanted to get saved. And so initially I'm thinking this is going to be a great day. Came back, you know, some game time, then came back talking as a continuation on the message on hell. And I thought, surely we're going to get to the gospel here. Surely we're, we're going we're gonna to turn this around and present Christ and him crucified. Came back with a third message. Another message on hell. And every message kids are raising their hands. And uh, all of us that are sponsors, especially those of us that are pastors and youth pastors, we were kind of uh, almost required that, you know, if you see kids, you need to go out and uh, counsel them. And so after, I think, the second session, I went out with a number of kids and presented the gospel. And I presented the gospel to them because I knew it hadn't been presented yet, sadly. And uh, one of the kids responded this way. I don't care about that. I just don't want to go to hell. And I remember kind of scratching my head thinking, you're missing the point. You, 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 there is no answer to hell if you don't care about the gospel. Uh, there is no free pass, get out of jail free card I can give you if you don't want the gospel. And for many years, we did not go back to Farm Tastic because I thought, you know, and I'm guessing a lot of pastors complained. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how that all worked out, but uh, I was kind of just dis very, very disappointed. Uh, that we have three messages on hell and its horrors, and no message, no mention of the gospel of Christ that is the means of the fear of God, the reality of, of who He is, as the means of the answer instead of just kids raising their hands saying, I'm scared to death now. I've heard message after message after message of, the horrors of hell, I don't want to go there. You admit you're a sinner? No, I'm good. I'm all right. I'm not as bad as the kids that will wait a minute. Time out. You understand the fear? No, I don't need that. You understand what Christ did for you? I can care less. All I can care about is I don't want to go to this place that I've been hearing about today. I don't want to go there. And I'm thankful that there were a number of kids, even that I was meeting with, that that uh, were longing. They, the message scared them enough that they said, I want to know, because I know that this is, I deserve this. And what a joy to be able to lead hearts to, to the Lord as a result of that. But what a sad reality when I know at least a couple of kids that I talk to, uh, scared to death of hell, no interest in Christ. And just assume that because they're scared of death of hell, that that's all they need to miss it, to avoid it. And uh, sadly, I believe that there's many churches today that are confident in their eternity solely because they don't want the fine, but they also don't want the, they don't want God, sadly. Do you fear God? He doesn't say, are you not even aware that you're about to die? <laughs> He's not saying, hey, doesn't this hurt you as much as it's gonna hurt him? 
And he's not acknowledging their suffering and their pain and their agony of the moment. He says, do you not fear God? Stop it. He's rebuking him. Stop it. And the boldness that he has, even to say that again, when the crowds are saying, obviously, the complete opposite. Both these we have initially, as far as Matthew and Mark record, initially are, are uh, kind of mocking Christ as the crowds and the soldiers were. But Luke records that one of them begins to rebuke the other and says, wait, do you not fear God? Not do you not fear hell? Not do you not fear death? Not do you not feel the pain and the agony that we're all going through? But do you not fear God? He continues on. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. For this man has done nothing amiss. Say this kind of in a uh, uh, kind of a roundabout way. Do, do you understand the justice of God, which ultimately then reflects on his very first statement there? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. Here this 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 thief is understanding who he is before a holy God. This man is understanding his sin before a holy God. He is understanding that what they are going through, they deserve. Two of them, we deserve this. But notice what he says about Christ. This man has done nothing amiss. Now we don't know his background. How much did he know about Christ before this moment? We don't know if he'd ever heard Christ, if he'd ever seen Christ, what his acknowledgement was. And certainly if he was just going by what he is hearing with his ears in that moment, he's hearing nothing good, except obviously he was close enough to hear the conversation between Christ and Mary and, and John. But beyond that, all this man is hearing in the moment is accusations of Christ. If you be the Son of God, why are you on that cross? Get down here. See, since you're not coming down, <laughs> it was just all a farce. It was all fake. It was all, it was all just a story. Here's a man that has come to a conclusion not only of the fear of God, but the just of God. We deserve this. He does not. And again, repentance is a, an important reality of, of salvation as a kind of a, as an offshoot of a reality of the fear of God and the justice of God. Repentance is a byproduct of, of that. Repentance does not save us, but it's a byproduct because we understand the very essence of, of, of salvation. Essentially, Paul, the Apostle Paul, acknowledged himself as the chief of sinners. And using the illustration of, of Paul sitting in churches today again, and I'm not going to think, I'm just saying in general, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of church, even some of the best churches in America, there are sitting people today who do not really believe that they would ever deserve hell. Hell is for that guy down the road who's always in jail. Hell is for that guy who's always fighting with his wife and he can hear the police out at their house day after day after day. Hell is for that thief. Hell is for that mass murderer. Hell is for that guy who brought the gun into the school and started shooting. Hell is for those kinds of people, but not for me. Death is for them. I'm not that bad. And this man is having an understanding not only of the fear of God, but ultimately, as he kind of acknowledges in verse 1, the justice of God. Uh, the very reality that, hey, I deserve this. I deserve what we are about to get. I deserve the death that will come upon us here within the hour. I deserve this as do you. He does not. And what a, a, a reminder that is. I, 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 certainly in Paul's day, we get on the, on the soapbox again. Certainly in Paul's day, um, his, his social media was pen and paper. And uh, his 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 expanse of social media was just how many different areas he sent that pen and paper. Do you know what Paul's social media account said then, as far as pen and paper? I don't come with flashing words of man's wisdom. I don't come to share with you all that I know. I don't come and present me to you. I come to present Christ and him crucified. Nothing more, 
nothing less. Christ and him crucified. And then he would also acknowledge again that he was the chiefest of sinners. Not even worthy of the grace, but thankful for it. That God would give unto him. And what a reminder again of just the, of the justice of God in our hearts and our lives. Do we grasp it? We indeed justly. We deserve this. Even before following the statement, do you not fear God and the realization of God and who he is, we deserve this. But this man has done nothing amiss. Now again, I know I pointed this out already, but let me help you get back to this thought. He is saying that as the soldiers are pointing out everything opposite of that very statement. As the chief priests and rulers are refuting everything he has just said. <laughs> Can you even imagine as, as they are standing at the foot of the cross saying, Whoa, time out, what did you just say? This man has done nothing amiss. And in their minds, I, I can guarantee you these other the entire community coming out, crucify him, crucify him. In their minds, the guy in the middle is the most worthy of death. They wanted him dead. They wanted him destroyed. They wanted him removed from the scene. And here's a thief that said, we deserve this. This one, he's done nothing wrong. He has done nothing that would require him to deserve this. Nothing amiss. Everything again in that moment that he is hearing says contrary. Everything that he is gaining from the crowd says contrary. Everything he's gaining from the Roman soldiers that hung him on the cross is contrary. Everything that he's hearing from the very chief rulers, not only our three Jews seen hanging on the cross, everything that they are hearing from their leadership is this man has done everything deserving of death. But understanding the justice of God, he says, we deserve it, he does not. And uh, what, a, what a testimony for a condemned man, for a condemned man on the cross to say this man doesn't deserve it. I do, not him. What a reminder of the fear of God and then as well the justice of God. Verse 22. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. I, I put the holiness of God. That's not necessarily, I guess it's not the full facet of what is being described here. Kind of the reign, the sovereignty, I guess you could say, even of Christ himself. As he says in these words, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What is he acknowledging by that? I, I want to caution, he's not, this is not about a lordship salvation thing. It's not what he's acknowledging here. Uh, but what, what is he acknowledging? That, that, that Christ is indeed who he says he is. That Christ is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords. That Christ is indeed the awaited Messiah. That Christ is indeed the one who has come to establish his kingdom. And remember, even in this moment, the disciples still aren't getting all the, all the puzzle pieces together. They're still kind of puzzled at, the, at this moment. But I thought he was coming to establish his kingdom, and yet here he is. This is, this is, a, this is not adding up to them. They wouldn't get it until a bit later. Uh, they, were, they themselves were confused. Here, this man on the cross says, in essence, I get it. <coughs> Excuse me. This man is establishing his kingdom. Remember me when you enter him. It wasn't about a kingdom here and now. It wasn't about the overthrowing of the Romans. It wasn't about, hey, right now would be a great time to overthrow them and get us all three of us off this cross. No, hey, there's going to be a reality that you are with us, but after your death, it's ultimately what he's saying here, after your death, your kingdom is going to be established. Remember me. What a... Uh, what a great clarity of what Christ had spent the last three, three and a half years. That they struggled on grasping. This man on the cross got it. Remember me. And we don't have any prayer. We don't have a, well, I mean, obviously speaking of Christ, so I guess in the message, that's ultimately a prayer. But we don't have a, we don't have a prayer of confession. We don't have a, any, uh, 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 what are some of the words I'm trying to, I, I'm losing, 
Uh, he, he did nothing to recompense all the sins that, that he is. He's not even able at this moment to repay the, the debt that he had to society and whatever it was that he stole. There was nothing that he was able to accomplish to make things right, so to speak, for his life, for his eternity, for his future. Acknowledge that here's who Christ is, and you are the means. <laughs> and you are the key. You are the means that hope for me. Remember me. Me who is a sinner worthy of death who's about to die and I deserve it. You who don't deserve it and you're about to die, your kingdom will be established. You are going to enter into that kingdom. Will you remember me then? Me who is nothing but a sinner who fears God in this moment, who seemingly probably did not before this moment, who fears God, who understands the justice of God, and understands the... And today, Christ says in verse 43, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That very response refutes the notion of purgatory, refutes the notion of salvation by works, and even including baptism, it refutes the notion you know, of being good enough, refutes the notion of, of raking, <laughs> barely making it into heaven. What we can gather by Christ's statement was that this man was fully saved. And I know I would trust that that's all elementary to us. We get that. We know that. But the sad reality is, is the testimony of this man that Luke alone records is lost on so many hearts and lives today. Who believe that I have to be good enough. Who believe that I have to work enough. Who believe that but salvation is a, a process that's going to take me some time. And uh, I just hope that I can finish this, this, this journey before my last breath to get everything in, in, in squared away and all my ducks in a row, so to speak, so, so that I can... That all of this is refuted by this man's very testimony and by the response of Christ. A man who had no opportunity to ever be baptized, a man who never had an opportunity to go and tell his neighbors about Christ. But a man from the cross whose testimony was probably stronger than most everyone else's testimony. Those who were still making a mockery of Christ in that moment. Because it didn't stop. In, in our dialogue here that have recorded for us, that was previous verses, all the mockery of Christ. And now we moved on to this conversation. This conversation is happening while the mockery is continuing. Three of them on the cross is taking place while soldiers are probably even increasing their mockery, just hearing what this one guy's saying. This is ridiculous. The chief priests are probably now mocking both of them. And the people walking by are just wagging their heads, perhaps even more. What is going on here? He's deceived another one, this great deceiver. And yet, at the same point, there's a man that is willing to have a testimony that says, do you not fear God? I deserve this. You deserve this. He's done nothing in this. And ask says, Lord, remember me today when you enter into your kingdom. Because you alone are the only means, the only hope that I have. And Christ's great response, today. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I know there's an argument what does paradise mean and where does that go and what was all involved there and, and what happened when Christ died. And we'll probably touch on some of that as we continue on here in the weeks ahead. Uh, but what a, 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 a striking reminder. And I hope that I'm preaching to the choir here this morning. But there are many who don't understand the fear of God. They understand the reality of hell, but they don't understand the fear of God. They don't understand the justice of God and the very reality of who they are. I'm not that bad. If I work hard enough, I definitely will help improve my not that bad status. And, and there are those that don't understand truly the ultimate holiness of, of our God. As though God could somehow accept me on my merit. This man has just acknowledged his sinfulness, but has asked Christ to accept him on his merit. Because of him, not because of himself. And what a, what a uh, striking reality. Several verses. The simplicity of the gospel spelled out by the testimony of one man who went from mocking Christ to having the promise of his eternity. And uh, what, what do you mean? How gradual is this? 
Now, thanks for vacation. I'm glad. Something, I guess I can't say I'm glad. I wish vacation was instant. I wish the moment that we became saved, we were instantly like our Lord. That would be marvelous. And uh, what, a, what a challenge. Can you imagine what it would be so, it was so different every time we got together? We're so different in our communities uh, and, and sharing Christ because we'd be exactly like Him. Wouldn't mean that anybody would accept us more or accept our message anymore. Uh, but can you just imagine how marvelous that would be, how different it would be? But the truth is, the sanctification, the whole process of becoming more like Him is. What well, it's going to take me sometimes. It's going to take me my life. And even as I stand before him, I think I'm still going to be amazed by how little I even grasp him here on this earth. But I am thankful that my salvation was instant. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we'll go to verses that say, it's going to be complete as I stand before him. The work of salvation will become complete as I stand before my holy God. Uh, but I'm thankful that in a moment, this man went from Mockery to acceptance. And Christ said today. And what a reminder. What a testimony for others as well tonight. Let's pray. So let me thank you again for your word. We thank you for a testimony of one soldier, one, or one, one criminal, one thief, one just like us, who hung on the cross and uh, acknowledged perhaps for the first time the very reality of his own sinfulness, the very reality of Christ, the very reality of God. And I do pray that, certainly if there's somebody here that has not done that today, that today would be the day. But I know that all of us have those in our family, have those in our workplaces, have those in, in our, our, our friendships that, that are hoping and uh, even claiming uh, an eternity with you who have yet to acknowledge who you are, who have yet to acknowledge who they are. They're just hoping that they can merit enough in this life they can accomplish enough in this life that, that they can be worthy enough after this life to stand before you. I pray that you would use us, use our testimony to be salt and light, even to remind us as an example of, of what salvation truly is all about and the glorious reality of what is accomplished for each one of us. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. A great closing hymn. 185, Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say that I strength and need a small child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me, and all in all, it stands to be saying, 185.